So, hello, bonjour, guten tag, osaya, kasaimas. Best you're going to get from me today. So, as that part of the slide says, my name is Steve, and as that part of the slide says, I am a geek. If we've turned up to the correct room, this will be a talk on Ada Lovelace and the very first computer program. Over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about that program, what it was, what it did, how it did it. I'm going to then convert that program into JavaScript, which I think is probably the easiest base level language to do it in. I will uh, then talk at the very end about that controversial subject, was Ada really the first programmer? So with all that in mind, who am I? What have I done to earn a place on this stage? Or as this slide should probably be called, the ego slide. This is where the speaker brags about themselves for 10 minutes, while everyone else fast forwards on YouTube for something else to watch. So who am I? What have I done? Well, I'm a geek. I've always been a geek. I do programming in various uh, forms, both in terms of what I code. I've been a games programmer, things like Xboxes and Games Cubes. I've done IoT, embedded development. I've done uh, server-side, front-end, cloud infrastructure. It's all the same code at the end of the day. I've done various edtech things, which was fun. I've done other bits of whatever I said on there, I've done it. Um, and outside of that, I like playing with Lego. That's Ada Lovelace in Lego. I thought it was topical. So. What's important is not what's on the slide. What's important is what is not on the slide. Although I live in Cambridge, I'm not one of the clever people from Cambridge who studies at the university. I'm not a professor who looks at old programs and old programmers to understand them. I do help out at the local computer museum because we're in Cambridge. We have a local computer museum. But all the things which I'm going to talk about over the next half hour are because I've learned about them just by reading. It's a long way of saying, if I can do this, anyone can. So where shall we start? Well, we'll start with the program itself, and it's that. This is, in a, this is a note of an appendix of a translation of an Italian book. So it's quite understandable that almost no one remembers what this was until Alan Turing pointed it out in the 50s or 60s. It did kind of get a little bit lost, and this was Ada's program. Any questions? Um, we'll go through it. Um, some of the writing is a bit small in places, so I'll try and uh, point things out. So this is what it did. It calculated Bernoulli numbers. Now, Bernoulli numbers are these things. Um, they're not interesting in themselves, but they have applications in both science and probability and various maths things. So engineers like this number sequence. Uh, the, the numbers are correct. You will notice there is no Bernoulli number for three, five, seven, and so forth. Technically, there are, but those numbers are all zero. So some textbooks, you'll see they just omit them entirely, and sometimes they refer to them as those even numbers. So these are what the Bernoulli numbers are. Fine, fair enough. Um, if you look at them in decimal, again, all this is showing you is there is no obvious pattern. These things come about through a computational process that is quite expensive. It takes human beings quite a long time to do this. And Charles Babbage, when he created the first machine, his difference engine, this was to remove humans and the human error from calculations. So the calculation itself is stuff with fractions, and it's that. Again, any questions? This is all Bernoulli numbers are. It's just repeating a series of multiplications and divisions and additions and subtractions over and over again. Now, if we rewrite this formula slightly, it looks like that. And this is interesting because you can see now there's a very obvious pattern. This 2n minus 1 over 2n plus 1, then there's 2n minus 1, 2n minus 2, 2n minus 3, and so forth. So it looks like the sort of thing a machine would be able to do very, very easily. And in fact, it can. 
So here it is uh, rewritten. I've expanded the terms. So you can see the Bernoulli number for five is the Bernoulli number for three multiplied by a thing and the Bernoulli number for one multiplied by a thing added to a constant. So you can see it's a good thing for a program to do. There's some processing and there's some storage. All the sort of things we'd expect. So this is a really good example to produce the very first program. Obviously, this wasn't in Ada's head when she produced the first program, not this will make a fantastic case study for people in the year 2023. It's just the problem she decided to solve. So how does it go about doing it? Well, I've already given you the answer. It's there. So what is actually going on here? Well, the easiest way to look at it is to break it down line by line and section by section. And we'll start with the left-hand side. That's the most interesting. So we start. The first column has a line number. Any people remember programming in BASIC? You'll remember line numbers. We don't have them anymore, really. But they're brilliant. Because with line numbers, you can introduce go-to statements. And they're brilliant, too. Some people are not sure if I'm joking on that one. <laughs> so we have a line number. One, two, three, simple. Nothing, nothing magical there. Next, we have the instruction. Multiply, subtract, addition. There is also divide. That's it. There's four instructions in this computer. That's all it does. Makes you wonder why Babbage could never finish it, really, if there's only four instructions. Next up, we have the variables acted upon and the operation. So here, Yes, I know the, the scan's very good, but variable two is multiplied by variable three. Anyone spot the other numbers? There's a little superscript before the V. This is not only saying this operation is V2 times V3, but V2 has been used or changed once, and that's why there's a one before the V. And the same with V3. It's changed once. Later on in the program, you'll see things like 2v2 and 2v6, saying variable 6 has been changed twice. So you've got an inbuilt way of checking whether you've been using your variables correctly. And the next column is the destination column. This one here. This is where we write the output of our multiplication. And you'll see there are three variables there. The machine, although it was never built, was designed to create a result and put this into more than one location at the same time. This was a mechanical machine. It had gears. So moving data around was very slow. So they said, right, well, in which case, I'll copy everything at once. As a consequence, there is no assignment instruction. You cannot say, I'm going to take a variable from variable 6 and put it into variable 5. It isn't possible. What you have to do instead is you have to add zero to one of those variables and put it into a new destination. Next up, we have some indications on those variables. As we said before, how often has this variable changed? And at the end, we have a comment. The very first program has comments in it, as opposed to the very last program that some of us have written, which has no comments. And that's it at the very end. That's, what do we get? Well, 2 times n. Yep, 2 times n minus 1, 2 times n plus 1. Because that first instruction, it writes the result of 2n into more than one place. So doing 2n minus 1 is quite simple. So I said there was no assignment instruction, right? How do we actually set up any variables if we don't have an assignment? Simple. We hard code it. So I showed you this bit at the beginning. At the top are the variables. They've labeled it data. And if we zoom in on that, when the program is start, when you start the program, you fill variable one with the value of one. You fill variable two with the value of two. And the way you would do this in the machine was be by setting the gears to that position. Those variables don't actually change. They're hardwired constants for the whole program. And if you're counting the fourth Bernoulli number, as we are in this example, we put four into variable three. That's what's going to get used. 
And underneath the column, as the program runs, you will see what is being held in those, in those variables, particularly if it's changing, 2n, 2n minus 1, and so forth. So let's start by breaking down this first program. We've already said we do 2n, so variable 2 has the number 2. We multiply that by n, which was in variable 3. Write it out, 4, 5, and 6. We then do 2n minus 1 by subtracting 1, because that's a constant, variable 1. Then we add 1. Then we divide variable uh, 3 by variable 4, and write that into variable... Hang on, wait a minute. 2n minus 1 is the first thing we do. That's variable 3. And 2n plus 1 is variable 4, but we're dividing the... Normal. Yeah, okay, that's, that's a bug. We're four lines into the very first program, and we have the very first computer bug. V4 is 2n minus 1, but actually we divide V5 by V4. So actually we're doing 2n plus 1 divided by 2n minus 1, not what it says on the right. The comments do not match the code. And when this happens, both are wrong. In this case, however, it's the comments which are wrong. The mathematics is actually correct if you go through and you work it out. When I started this, this wasted me a day. How on earth can dividing two numbers be so difficult? So once we've fixed it, and we found that first computer bug, we make a note of it, we tweet about it, we feel very impressed with ourselves, and we think, right, I've got it working. And I got it working on paper first, as we all do, right? We dry run on paper to make sure our code works. I see a lot of people nodding and lying at the same time when they say, yes, of course I test my code. So let's put this into JavaScript. Very, very simple. We have an operation. We have the two operands, the A and the B, and the destination. As we say, this machine, this pretend machine, would allow you to write the result into more than one place at once. So we need an array. Unfortunately, we only need the array once. This feature of the machine is never used again in the entire program. So we have to make a special case for line one. So we've got our, uh, we've got our objects. They're in a nice array. So we can just iterate through with a program counter that says, if we're multiplying, take A and take B, multiply them together, and put the result in the mill. The mill is what they called an accumulator. It is just a temporary store. There's nothing more clever about that, but this was the term of the day. Uh, addition, subtraction, everything you'd expect. And because this is JavaScript, these are all floating point numbers of some description. And that's the, that's the rest of it. We go through, we write the result, the mill, into each of the destination registers, each of those variables, increment the program counter, and continue. That can't be all of it, right? It's got to be something else. So we go back to this. We remember this. We have the Bernoulli numbers. And we can see, right, Bernoulli number 3 that we computed a little while ago is being used. Bernoulli number 1, which we calculated before that is being used. And we perform that operation. So yes, we need that storage. And here follows a repetition of operations 13 to 23. That's the loop. That's the very first loop ever created. And it suffices in one comment. We do all these instructions again. Yeah, there's a problem there. There was a constant. Now, by that I mean, when you say, I multiply variable 2 by variable 3, you are saying variable 2 and variable 3. The loop that Ada talks about is quite literally a copy and paste of code, which of course we don't do anymore, very often, if the boss is looking. But here, v2 times v3 is always going to be v2. There is no way of saying, oh, look at, look at this variable and then work out a number from this other variable. So if a variable said 6, you can't say use variable 6. You have to explicitly code it. It's essentially saying you can't have a raise. So v index is just not possible. But she says here follows a repetition of operations 13 to 23. 
meaning it isn't a repetition of these operations, because if it was, it would be using the same variable. So to compute Bernoulli number five, you would have to copy and paste the code for Bernoulli number three and the code for Bernoulli number one, and then put some extra glue logic around it. Probably the first case of a computer program lying to the next programmer that comes along to try and understand it. So what's the transformation process? Um, that link on GitHub, for those that want to look at it, you can see each of these steps in process. There's, it's not difficult, and there's probably not a lot of point of explaining this, because it is straightforward transformation. So we start, we've got A times B written into registers four, five, and six. So we put that into a state, and we assign only the multiplication. Well, referencing everything as state open brackets isn't very sensible. It's not very nice as a naming convention. So we'll then rename that to N, N2 M1, 2 times N minus 1, just to give us a little more context to map back to the original program. We're calling it accumulating total now rather than register 2. And then we transform it again by working out, well, this is the numerator of that calculation, this is the denominator, and actually call it numerator and denominator. Because we all like sensible variable names, right? Unless your variable names are X and Y and you're looking at a coordinate, you should probably have more than one letter for your variables. That's not controversial, is it? No. Although there is a language, I think, that uses all underscores for its variable names. So underscore is a variable, under underscore is a variable, underscore, underscore, underscore is another variable. Which makes it look even more like Perl than Perl does. Is any, oh, people are old enough to remember Perl when that was a going concern. Good. Uh, so yes, we're, we're just transforming this line up by line, accumulating fractions, numerators, denominators, adding the totals up, moving on to the next one, and writing out the results. You'll notice in some of the earlier examples, uh, when we say this is how we compute Bernoulli numbers, there's always a minus sign in there. That's just the math, so we just throw it in at the end. And the job's all done. So, was she the first programmer? This is where I have to don my protective flame suit, because apparently there are some people who think that she wasn't. So let's look at sort of some of the evidence. She wrote a piece of code where the comments don't match. I think we've probably all done that. She's written code with a bug in it. We've all done that. She's written a piece of comment that says, you've got to copy and paste some code to make this work. Yeah, we've all done. So by every metric, she's done exactly what every programmer does. So it feels like she is the first programmer. But these are the arguments that keep coming up again. You know, there's a bug in it. The, the loop notation doesn't work, so it was never going to be a real program. Uh, this was a translation. Now, to, if you, <laughs> to be fair, the original book was about yay big. She added well over that to the original. It was not the work of a uh, banal translation. A lot of content was added to explain what was going on in the original work. And Babbage must have written programs for his own machine. The machine, as I said, was never actually built. Several reasons for this. One of them, Charles Babbage was a grumpy old man who didn't get on with people, and therefore did not get on with the people who had the money that he needed to build the machine. So it didn't really happen. Um, and I'm sure some of us can relate to the grumpy old men not doing what they're supposed to. So Babbage must have written something for this machine that he was creating. It's like, well, not really. Babbage liked the hardware. He liked the engineering part of how do you build a machine, but wasn't really interested in the software component. Anything that he did jot down would have been the gentle equivalent of Hello World. And that doesn't constitute a program. This at least has an algorithm involved. So I kept thinking, there's got to be an argument because all of these arguments are negative. She can't be the program because this. She can't be a programmer because that. And as my homegirl Tay Tay says, haters got to hate. So I figure, let's turn that around. If every argument is negative, 
She is not a programmer because. Can I create an argument that is, she is the first programmer because, and then have an answer? And I thought about this. And there was only one I could come up with. Because as well as this algorithm, she's done other thought into the, the programming uh, universe. So she had the idea that the numbers in the machine didn't need to represent numbers. They did represent numbers because it was a machine for calculating and for creating tables for mathematicians and for engineers. But she said, well, this number could represent a word. And that word could be used in a poem, and that computer could generate poetry. She invented chat GPT 200 years too early. She said, well, this, this number doesn't need to represent a number. It could represent a note on a musical scale. She invented MIDI, accidentally. So she's done all of these things, all the sort of things that programmers do. They come up with something, and they think, I could use this for everything. So we've already, she's already expanded the idea of what a program could do, not just engineering, arts as well. She's expanded the notion of programming to be not just hello world, but a full algorithm, and explained how that algorithm can work, how to break it down in steps, how to comment it in code, everything you need to be a programmer. So what is, you know, if, if this argument can't get through, what is the one trumping argument that I can give to justify calling her the very first programmer? And it was simply, given all of this work that she's done, these ideas about it being used for music, or for creating poetry, or for calculations, for algorithms, if all of this work had been done by a man, would he have been considered the very first programmer? And I figured, yes, he would. And if he would have done, then she should have done. So therefore, she is the first programmer. End of story, because I said so. And my word is final, because I have the microphone. So with that, we'll say, yes. If a man had done it, he would have been the first programmer. So Ada was the first programmer, because she did it. End of story. And that is the first program. And now you all understand it, right? If not, I probably have time for questions, but as we say, the first programmer did decimal approximations of Bernoulli numbers as used by engineers the world over. The algorithm described what to do, but how, rather than this hand-wavy thing you sometimes get from management, oh, I'm the ideas person, you just make it happen. No. She explained exactly how it had to happen, line by line, explaining as she went, commenting the code, okay, with one bug exception explaining how it all works. And we've established beyond any doubt she was that first programmer.